again, my name is Brent Levac. If you were here yesterday, uh, you had my introduction. So I'm just a member of the uh, NVIDIA HPC SDK team. I do a lot of customer support, attend hackathons and help out wherever I can. So uh, today we're gonna talk about Open HCC first, and then I'm gonna also talk about OpenMP. These are two directive-based models, and we'll talk about the similarities and the differences uh, between the two models. Uh, Open HCC resources. So there's a, a website, openhcc.org, has a lot of the resources like the specification, uh, where to find uh, literature on it, where to find maybe some blogs or success stories, upcoming events. So uh, through NVIDIA, we have a lot of hackathons over the course of the year. I'm uh, currently involved with one at Georgia Tech. And I've been involved with a lot of the hackathons over the years. And the hackathons are open to people uh, using, of course, OpenACC, also OpenMP, just CUDA, I don't know that we've had anybody come to the hackathon just to work on standard par yet, but uh, uh, that should happen this year, I would think. So let's continue on here. Basic syntactic concepts. So both OpenMP and OpenACC use directives. We, I guess, in Fortran, the the correct name is directive. In C, maybe the it's also called a directive, but it's pound pragma. Uh, so you say pound pragma ACC directive name, or in, in Fortran, most Fortran that I've come across now is, is free form. So you say bang dollar ACC directive. So the directives in open ACC are roughly divided into two groups, uh, compute directives. And we'll talk a lot, about, about, a lot about those and data management directives. And there's also a runtime API. So that's typically used for things like device selection and other less used functionality. So the point of a directive based model is you can add directives to your source code and it uh, will do the desired behavior if the compiler recognizes those directives. Now, if you use a compiler that doesn't recognize those directives, either it doesn't have that capability or you don't turn the, the compiler options on to recognize those directives, you should still have your original sequential code, uh, which will work the way it always has. So that's both powerful and uh, it has a few drawbacks. Uh, I have to warn people, I have been involved many times at hackathons in, in my own work where I have misspelled the directive. I've said bang ACC or bang bang ACC that we've just you know created a typo when we type things in. And you pro will probably do that yourself if you use directives a lot. And then it just becomes a comment. And I've been at a hackathon where we've wasted like half a day <laughs> because we had a typo in the comment. And so the directive wasn't doing what we thought it should be doing. It was just a, a comment. So, um, so you got to take the good with the bad a little bit. Uh, the figure on the right, of course, is the typical uh, view of accelerated code. So, you know, 90% of your application code deals with setup, file IO, some serial processing and things. But the, the idea is usually that 10% of your code is where you spend 90% of your time. So you need to put the directives around those compute intensive functions to offload that bit of code to run you know, multiple times faster, hopefully on a GPU. And you still run the uh, rest of the sequential code on the CPU. I'm gonna kind of uh, keep with the, uh, the design of, of these two day talks, and we'll start with the highest level first. So, the highest level compute construct in OpenACC is the kernels construct. And there have been many successful ports of applications that only use ACC kernels. And what they do is they just kind of 
find the, the section of code and they put ACC kernels at the beginning and end kernels at the end. So what this does is expresses that this region of code may contain parallelism and it's up to the compiler to determine what can safely be parallelized and offloaded to the GPU. So depending on the compiler, you may have you know, begin kernels, end kernels, and you can have multiple sections or multiple loops inside of there. And the compiler is free to identify the number of parallel loops in there and, and generate multiple kernels uh, for offload. In this case, it could generate two kernels or it could you know, fuse the two loops and generate one kernel. It's not specified by the, uh, the OpenAC C spec uh, how many kernels to generate here. It's up to the compiler's capabilities and the compiler analysis to make that decision for you. And like I said, many people are comfortable with this and it's worked in a lot of uh, major applications. <clears throat> The other uh, high-level uh, compute construct is the parallel loop directory. So this is a little bit more designed after the opening MP parallel loop. And that is, it's a little more specific and it does not give the compiler as much leeway in how it generates the kernels. So you basically say pragma ACC parallel or pragma ACC parallel or pragma ACC loop. And so uh, just like in OpenMP, ACC parallel just starts a kernel region and then you uh, put the work sharing loops inside or the upper example, ACC parallel loop is a combined directive, both parallel and loop inside the same directory. And you can do it either way, they are equivalent. Uh, if you say ACC parallel and you're in Fortran, you need to have an end parallel. The same in C, if you say pragma ACC parallel by itself, then you use curly braces to uh, delimit the parallel region. So again, actually this was, if we go back to the beginning of open ACC, uh, the parallel region was uh, proposed by Cray and that's how they were doing uh, GPU offload. The kernels region was proposed by PGI, and that's how we were doing uh, GPU offload. And so when we des they designed OpenACC, they decided to use both forms. And that's why we have two forms of the compute construct today. <clears throat> so OpenACC exposes three levels of parallelization, and the terms they use are gang, worker, and vector. So you can use those uh, terms on loops. And I, as we'll show later, there are other uses for these. Uh, if you are familiar with CUDA, uh, the gang level is basically the blocks in the grid. And the vector level is basically the threads in a block. Now there is a middle layer called the worker level of parallelism. It's not used very often, but it is there. And what our compiler, how our compiler treats that is if you have worker level parallelism, typically the worker will be another dimension within the thread block. The vector dimension will be in CUDA terms, a single warp. So if you have worker and vector parallelism, uh, it's almost assured that the vector length will be 32 and that will be 30 threads, 32 threads that make up a CUDA warp. And the worker level parallelism will be multiple warps in a thread block. So you can specify uh, loops that you want scheduled particularly in a certain way. So I could have in the upper example, I could have the outer loop, loop gang, I could have the middle loop loop worker. I could have the innermost loop loop vector. And that's a, a common way to do it. Another way that I've ended up using more and more, the more experience I get is just the bottom block there. ACC parallel loop uh, 
collapse tree. And I let the compiler uh, compute the, 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 what am I trying to say? The decomposition of the three loops inside the kernel. And I'll show a little bit more example of that later. So you can put gang and vector on that and it will use both uh, the blocks in a grid and the threads in a block for running that. And you just kind of end up with the default uh, configuration that the compiler chooses. There are ways to adjust the gang supporters and vectors. And this you can use this when you when you know a little bit more about the loop bounds than the compiler. Uh, so there are you know heuristics that our compiler uses that have been developed over the years to find you know typically good numbers for the number of gangs based on the, the trip loop count if it knows it and the vector length and and the, the a funny anecdote is over the years, it just kind of turns out that if you have gangs and vectors, the vector length of 128 is almost always the best. <laughs> so trade secret. <laughs> uh, we've, we've tried lots of different things and lots of flexibility and it just always seems to be 128 is a good number. <clears throat> so, uh, but if you, if you know something like, you know, my vector dimension of my arrays is not 128, it's only 30 or 32 or you know a short number, you can force the vector length to be smaller. So vector length Q, use a vector length of Q for this parallel region. Of course, you can change this for every different kernel, uh, which is nice. You don't have to have one setting over the whole program. So this gives you some flexibility and it's a little more like, uh, CUDA in that you can have different launch bounds for every different kernel. So we talked about yesterday a little bit about do concurrent and some of the limitations of do concurrent. And one of the ones that I pointed out was you don't have any control over the launch configuration in do concurrent currently. And so open ACC and open MP as we'll show, uh, give you uh, some flexibility and control over the launch configuration. Of the kernel. You do not always want to work share a loop in your kernel. So sometimes you want every thread to run the entire loop. Uh, you want, so this is often the case in, you know, multi-dimensional loop uh, constructs. So if you have a four or five, I've even seen seven deep nested do loops in Fortran. Some of the loops, you just want every thread to run sequentially. So you can force that using uh, ACC parallel by saying ACC loop SEQ for sequential. So you can still you know, work share outermost loops and then run sequentially an innermost loop. Or you, you can actually run sequentially not the innermost loop. You can, the ACC loop sequential can occur anywhere in the loop uh, structure or above any uh, for loop. One recommendation for you is that don't put ACC loop sequential on the loops that have arrays with the index being the leading dimension of your array. So, Yesterday, I talked about the most important thing for uh, performance on a GPU was at the vector dimension, use the vector index as the leading dimension of most of your array accesses. So in this example, maybe it's not great because the array accesses are pretty mixed up. There's IJ, IK, and KJ. So, uh, so it's not 100% clear which one should be the vector dimension. Uh, but in general, that's not always the case. Lots of times, every array is accessed the same way. <clears throat> uh, this last note, sometimes the mInfo messages will tell you that the compiler found a dependency in one of the loops and forced it to be SEQ. 
And sometimes even if you mark the loop as SEQ, the compiler M info will still tell you that, which is kind of an annoyance to me. But uh, again, we've stressed this many times, look at the M info output and verify that what the compiler is doing uh, syncs with what you think should be happening. <clears throat> Uh, both OpenACC and OpenMP, as I'll show later, have a collapse clause, and I've found this more and more useful uh, over the years. Uh, so it's useful when the loop extends for short, uh, or there are more loops than levels. So, you know, I mentioned you could have a four, five, six dimensional, you know, do loops or four loops, and you only have three levels of parallelism. But maybe some of the loops are short, like you know, only one to four or zero to seven or something like that. So, you know, you don't want to dedicate a whole, you know, loop to one of your units of uh, parallelism. So you want to collapse a couple of those together. So if you have the code on the left, basically what the compiler does is takes the two loop bounds, both n in this case and creates a single loop from zero to n times n. And then if you use i and j as indices into arrays, it does you know, the correct arithmetic, either divide or mod or, or both. I don't know if I did that exactly right, but it, it's something like that uh, to get the i and j values. And so you might think, well, that's just a lot of overhead. But remember that these loops are loop shared so every thread has to do this anyway, right? So it doesn't create any more work than you would have to do anyway by the time that the, the, the loops from zero to n minus one are mapped onto some number of threads or some number of blocks. So uh, the work is done anyway. You shouldn't see a performance degradation for this little bit of extra arithmetic. Calling user routines in device code. So this uh, is a nice feature of OpenACC. It's a little bit different in OpenMP. And where you start here is in the lower right-hand corner, ACC parallel. So I'm gonna specify the number of gangs and the vector length here. And I'm gonna call a function or subroutine G. And so you can see that when you compile program main, the compiler doesn't know anything about what's in FG. I mean, it may if it's in the same file and you're, or you're doing some type of interprocedural optimization. Uh, but I'm, I'm basically just calling FG. And so FG could be marked as a routine gang and routine gangs can have loop gangs within them. So, FG calls FV. So FV is a function that's a routine vector. And so vector routines can have vector loops inside of them. And then uh, inside the vector loop, I call FS, which is another function, but it's a sequential function and it just returns some function of, of A. So you can have pretty deeply nested call chains in OpenACC. And the each call in the, this is a Fortran example, in the Fortran sense, the call has to be explicit and you need to know the interface of the routine you're calling. So maybe this example isn't quite right that uh, FG, FV and FS need to be either in an interface block or in a module that program main can see. So OpenACC makes it a little easier on the compiler vendor in that when you compile and call routine FG, you know what level in the parallelism tree or hierarchy that each routine is in. Is it a gang level routine? Is it a vector level routine? Or is it a sequential level? There's also worker 
again, we uh, don't use worker very often. <clears throat> Uh, I think I've talked a little bit already about reduction clauses, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, and we'll talk about it in OpenMP2. They're almost, and in fact, they may be identical between OpenACP and OpenMP2. So it uh, takes many values and reduces them into a single value. The way that the compiler and runtime do this under the hood is the subject of a lot of. Uh, uh, experimentation, research, churn, and we're fixing it all the time. We almost have like a full-time compiler person that just works on reductions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's, it's a very important part of the GPU code generator. So each thread calculates its parts. Uh, the reduction doesn't have to just be a high level reduction over the whole kernel. You can have reductions uh, within a gang over a, a vector uh, or over a, a worker, or uh, you know, if it's if it's a sequential loop, then it's not really a reduction because every thread is computing its sum. But the compiler will insert code uh, to produce the single result uh, at whatever level you need. And if you've ever written a reduction in CUDA, you know just how nice of a feature this is. This was uh, a big step forward when we were, uh, I was playing around with CUDA Fortran in the early days. So these are the, the reduction operators that are just what you would expect. And, and so I'm gonna go over that quickly. Now we're gonna move on to data regions. The, Data construct defines a region of code in which GPU arrays remain on the GPU and are shared. So you can have, this is an example on the left of a structured data region. So a structured data region exists all within the same function or subroutine in Fortran. There's a definite beginning and end in the same program unit. And within that, uh, the data within the data directives will remain on the GPU uh, the entire time. Uh, it, the structured data region does give the compiler a little bit more information because the data region is in the same function. And sometimes we can take advantage of that and do things a little nicer. Uh, and we'll talk about that. So um, data clauses. So all copy and create clauses behave as their present or variants. Uh, a little bit of history, OpenACC 1.0, we did not have data uh, regions at all. Uh, at every kernel, we copied the data over, ran the kernel and copied the data back. Uh, then later we decided, well, the same style of directives that we use to generate kernels, we can use to generate data uh, motion or data movement. So we created things called, you know, copy in, copy out, uh, all these. Uh, and then about a year later, we decided, well, when we port code, a lot of times we put the data directives just around the kernels and then we move one subroutine higher, and then we put data directives there, and then we move another subroutine higher and put data directives there. And that's kind of the, the method of tuning for performance is to move the data movement higher and higher in your program. So it's you know resident over all the time steps, for instance, we talked about yesterday. So it occurred to us that really, we don't wanna have to remove the data directives, but we've always had this notion that the data directives are present or copy, present or copy in, present or copy out. So what that means is uh, the OpenACC runtime and OpenMP, I think in all compilers have this thing called the present table. And when you reach a data directive, you look up in the present table and say, is this data already present on the GPU? And if it is, 
the data directive basically becomes a no op. So you don't suffer the performance penalty of copying in at every level of your call tree. You only do it at the highest level, and then you just have a tiny little performance hit just to check the present table, which is just a you know reading a little bit of, from the CPU memory. So it's it's not a very expensive operation at all. So this trips up a lot of people. And in fact, just last week, I was working with a person on a code and they had a C++ code where they had the data directives in a class and they had the, you know, the class constructor started the data region and then the class destructor ended the data region. And then they had other direct data directives sprinkled through their code. And it was a present or problem that the data was not getting updated correctly because they thought the data was getting updated when it was actually already present. So uh, just a little history there and something to watch out for that these data clauses are present or variants. In fact, our compiler probably still accepts the syntax present or copy, uh, which was shortened to P copy. And then it just became copy is the same as copy. So <clears throat> kind of digress there a little bit, but copy of list, copies both in and out. Copy in, of course, only copies in. Copy out, only copies out. Sometimes you don't uh, even need a copy of the GPU. It's just kind of a scratch space while you're in the kernel. So that's create. And OpenACC has something called present where it just checks. Uh, and so it's assumed that there's a, a data directive outside of, uh, of this data directive. So I'm just checking uh, that the data is already present. I can assume it is. If it's not, uh, we're going to get an error from the OpenACC runtime. Unstructured data regions. Uh, so as I mentioned before, structured data regions, the begin and end has to be in the same program unit. Uh, that worked great for a while, but then, you know, there's complicated codes where all the data is created in the init function and all the data is uh, torn down in the, the final function and stuff like that. So you wanted the data directives where the data was initialized. So these are unstructured. You can have enter data uh, at any point in the in your program, you can have exit data at any point. They don't need to be in the same program unit. It only makes sense when you have an enter data to use copy in or create. And it only makes sense when you leave a data region, uh, an unstructured data region to have copy out or delete. <clears throat> uh, so, this is not a, a real complicated example, but it at least gives you the syntax. So uh, the unstructured data regions have this notion of dynamic data lifetimes. I'm not going to go through this too much, but the one thing I wanted to point out here is that there is another form of data directives that I didn't touch on anywhere else, and that's the ACC declare create uh, data directive. And what this is useful for is two cases. One is for global data. So in Fortran, if you have data in a module, that's global data. See, it's like data at the global level. And also it can be used for like local arrays within a function. So in Fortran, like automatic arrays that have the lifetime of the function. So they have a dynamic lifetime which is how long that unit is in scope. So it's easiest to think about in a subroutine, you have an automatic array in there that lives as long as the subroutine is in scope. The compiler will generate a GPU copy of that for you upon subroutine entry and tear it down upon exit if you put that array in declare create. So there's the present or, and so you might say, well, that's kind of annoying. What if I really need to update the GPU or CPU 
uh, copy of the data. So there's the update directory. So this is actually a always a actionable uh, directive. So it always updates. It's not a present or operation. So a lot of times you have a you know your data directory is really high out, but you need to get that data onto the CPU or update the values on the GPU. And typically, or, or one common example of this is say you need to do MPI communication. So, uh, you know, I need to update the host version of X in the code down below right before I do an MPI send of X. So, um, so that's why you would use the update clause. So the, the spec itself, they changed host to be update self. Uh, I find that kind of annoying. So I still use update device and update host, but host and self are for the most part, the same thing. There's a notion in the spec that you could do an update on the GPU. So self would be device, but I don't think in practice I've ever seen that. <clears throat> so again, here's the, uh, uh, just the syntax of this, no big, uh, surprises here. One thing that you may not be aware of is that the data in an update clause does not need to be contiguous. Uh, this is nice in Fortran. You can give it like a, a slice of an array. You can update the internal interior of a two-dimensional array, uh, something like that. It implies that the data must be present. So you will get a runtime error if you try to update something that is not present. It does not do a create or any type of create before copy. <clears throat> Array shaping. Uh, so sometimes the compiler knows the shape of your arrays. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, in C, C++, sometimes you just pass a pointer. And the shape is sort of just up to the programmer to uh, take care of. In Fortran, you always just pass a reference, but the dimensions sometimes can be different in the Fortran subroutine than they are at the high level, right? There's still, uh, you can just say star is the shape of the array. <clears throat> so if you suspect something is wrong here, examine the M info output. And the M info tells you what it assumes uh, the uh, sizes of the arrays are. Uh, if you want to be explicit, you can put the shape on your copy in and copy out uh, um, directives. But note there is a little difference between C and C++ and Fortran. So we took the lead from it was an Intel product. Intel had some definition of C array syntax. And their definition that they had was starting element colon number of elements. So it seemed to be, you know, kind of the way that C and C views uh, uh, aggregates, I guess, is, is the right word. Uh, but that's not the Fortran syntax. The Fortran syntax for slices, which is part of the language and has been since Fortran 90, is beginning element or starting ending, starting element, colon, ending element. So one to N. It's a little easier because Fortran begins numbering at one. So be aware of that uh, when you uh, need to be explicit about your copy in and copy out. These uh, you know, data clauses can be on data parallel kernels directives, uh, the copy in and cop data copy out and associated things can be occur on a lot of directives. Oh, and one thing I was gonna mention is we made a recent change probably two releases ago that we used to support copy in A of N. And we would treat N as one colon N. And we got into some issues with that where people wanted only to copy in a single element, A of N. 
So about two releases ago, we made a change to require, you know, the colon notation. Otherwise, we will just copy in one element. And we have a way to, with a flag, I have to look and see what it is. But it's like implicit sections or something like that to go back to the old behavior. But that is really non-standard behavior. <clears throat> so I recommend highly that you use the colon in your uh, array shaping. Uh, so I think I'll have this slide in both my open ACC and open MP uh, talks. It's a useful slide. Uh, I refer to it a lot, so I'm glad that I wrote it. It's the open ACC data directives on the left, open MP data directives on the right. They are almost identical other than you know, slight syntax changes. In fact, our compiler uses the same exact runtime as for data management between OpenACC and OpenMP. Uh, um, there is so much similarity that we hardly need any special code to handle the two. Uh, let's see, I got six minutes, five more slides. Um, a few other important things to talk about in OpenACC. Uh, almost all applications use CUDA libraries. So how do I use OpenACC to do my data management, but still pass device pointers into the uh, CUDA library? So uh, I have a Fortran example on the left, a C example on the right. It's the same basic uh, syntax. You use bang dollar ACC host data, use device, uh, and give it the array that you want to pass. The device array, the device pointer, within that block. So when I call curand generate here, G is the curand generator, so that still lives on the host. But I'm filling a device array from curand, and so. Because A is in a data region here, that data copy up above, uh, the compiler can know for the host version of A, what is the associated device pointer, and I'll pass that into Kuran generate. So uh, we use this all the time for calling Kuran, Kublas, QFFT, and uh, um, you'll, if you use any of those in your HPC application, you'll get to know these directives uh, pretty well. <clears throat> uh, this is asynchronous behavior, queues and streams. So again, I have a uh, Fortran on the left, uh, C on the right, and it's done pretty much the same way. This is probably almost an entire talk in itself. Uh, in my introduction, I just want to mention uh, that OpenACC uses queues, and the queues are numbered. So you just kind of pick an arbitrary number. You know, on the left, I picked 10, and that's my queue number that I'm using in OpenACC. So uh, I can do update device async 10. I can do kernels async 10. I can do update host async 10. And that's just an OpenACC queue. But in OpenACC, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the queue number and a CUDA stream. And I assume Max later today, when he talks about CUDA, will talk a little bit more about CUDA streams. But it is sort of a delimiter or a, a queue that uh, have dependencies within the stream, but uh, multiple streams can run somewhat independently. So. The call you want to really focus on here is when we set the QFFT set stream, there's an API function called ACC get CUDA stream, which you give it the CUDA, I mean the OpenACC async number, and it returns the CUDA stream. And a CUDA stream is a 64-bit handle, basically. We treat it in Fortran as a 64-bit int. Uh, on the right, again, is uh, C, same general idea, I used 12 there. So you 
you can just kind of arbitrarily pick integers, what is mostly done in OpenACC for your async numbers. Uh, OpenACC does allow you to uh, tune your code a little bit like CUDA, and it has something called the cache directive, which I'm showing on the right here. I haven't really talked about private, but uh, it's kind of a common notion among OpenMP and OpenACC that you can have private data at the gang level or at the sector level. At the gang level, there will be one copy of that per uh, block, red block in CUDA. And that's very convenient because CUDA has shared memory that can be used across you know, all the threads in a thread block. So in this case on the right, the tile array is actually put into CUDA shared memory and it is accessible very quickly and with high performance. So uh, the way on the Fortran, CUDA Fortran on the left, where you declare something as shared, uh, and then this is just CUDA Fortran on the left. On the right, you can do almost exactly the same operation uh, using the tile array in vector loops that are collapsed twice, once to fill the tile, and then the second loop to read from the tile. Uh, this is the final slide. Uh, HPC GPU compilers commonly used options. I've talked uh, and we've discussed some of these already. You can ex explicitly use managed memory or no managed memory. Uh, we talked yesterday that STPAR, standard PAR, turns on the manage memory flag. Uh, lots of people find this pretty useful, um, but there are some you know, drawbacks of it, and sometimes it's performance issues. Max reg count is, is kind of a code generator uh, flag. You know, there are a limited number of registers. You can kind of force the compiler to use less registers and spill those more. Uh, GPU equals line info is, is useful if you're needing to use some debugging or diagnostics. Uh, I think Max yesterday talked about compute sanitizer. So you get a little bit more information out of the compute sanitizer if you have some you know, it's called dwarf information or line information in your executable. GPU equals compute capability XY, uh, only generate code for a particular compute capability. If you're just running on Perlmutter, you really only need to generate, you know, code for Ampere, which is CC80. <clears throat> and finally, we added a feature maybe a year or two ago called auto compare. Uh, well, actually, it's called PCAST, and PCAST stands for Parallel Compiler Assisted Software Testing. So you can compile with GPU equals auto compare, and it will automatically run your kernels both on the CPU and the GPU, and then compare the results at the end. And you can have some control over the comparison, whether it's exact compare or provide a tolerance. And you can find bugs that way, maybe things that were not, you know, updated correctly between host or GPU or, you know, real compiler bugs or something. So auto compare is a big hammer, does it everywhere. Uh, it turns on GPU equals redundant. And so we have a section in our uh, user notes about, there's an, actually an API. So you can uh, turn on this redundant uh, execution on CPU and GPU on a section by section basis, and then just specify which arrays do I want to compare uh, between CPU and GPU. So that's it for OpenACC.